I am enchanted when Lori Irvin gives those children's sermons, mesmerized by that. We should just end the service right now. <laughs> but you have me right now, so let's pray. May your written word be our guide, your Holy Spirit our teacher, and your glory our chief concern. Amen. Um, according to two cardiologists in San Francisco, there are two types of personalities. Do you know those two types of personalities? There is type A, and there is type B personality. And it was Meyer, Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenbaum who came up with this um, theory, I believe in the, in the 1970s, and they kind of discovered it by accident. And it had to do with the chairs in the waiting room of their office. And, um, and so they noticed that they were getting worn. So they called a, a person who was an expert in reupholstering these things, and that person came into the office, and he gave them a good looking over, inspecting those different chairs. And he found out that they were worn in an unusual way. The upholsterer said, there's something different, something different about the people who come to your office for their examinations. And the upholsterer said, have you noticed this pattern in your chairs? And the doctors scratched their heads and they said, no, we haven't noticed any pattern. He said, well, first of all, the arms of the chairs are all worn off. Look here. And secondly, if you look closely in these chairs, you would expect to see the whole fabric of the chair to be worn off on the entire seat of the chair. Um, but not in these cases, in, not, not with regard to these chairs in, in the waiting room. Every single one of them has their front edge um, that has been worn off of the chair. And uh, so it looks like the patients that you have tend to sit on the front edge of their seat and leap up frequently. Well, you know, the doctors scratched their heads and they dismissed the observations of this re-upholsterer. Um, but five years later, they said, hey, there must be something um, to this chair. And um, they noticed that their patients, their cardiac patients, literally sat on up on the front of their seats, um, uh, set up at the end of their seats, and maybe they did that in their life too as well. So they came up with what? Type A personality. And so a type A personality is very, very competitive, works hard, strives for goals, and um, um, wants to accomplish a lot of things, but that person seems to struggle with the clock. There's never enough hours in a day, and they te tend to get easily wound up about things, anxious, overact, stressed, maybe, maybe hyper alert. But then there's type B personality. These people tend to be more relaxed, easygoing, non-competitive, take life in stride, be more imaginative, and maybe are a little bit more creative than type A personalities. Well, there is an old joke among marriage and family therapists. What happens when you get a competitive, um, hardworking type A personality when a type A personality meets a more relaxed type B easygoing personality? What happens? They get married. <laughs> Huh, that's an old joke. Maybe you heard it before. Um, well, maybe, well, here's a question. What kind of world do you think we live in today? A type A or a type B world? I'm not gonna let you answer that question right now. You can answer that at home. But I, I think even though many of our homes is, we're living in social isolation, we're tired, getting tired of that word, and I think we're living more in a type A kind of world. Lots of people are living on uh, the edge of their seats. They're wondering what their future is as far as their future business, as far as their small businesses are concerned. They're wondering how they're going to be able to support their family. They notice scratchy folks, 
uh, scratchy throats, throats and a cough, and they're wondering if this is the symptom for the virus, and you can't blame them. You can't blame us here. We worry too. We worry about you. We worry about our friends in the variety parts of the country here. Um, we worry about our EMT responder son who lives up, first responder son who lives up in Denver, and our niece who is a physician in the Chicago, in the poor side of Chicago now. And we are kind of flooded with all different kinds of news and perspectives. In the Gospel of John that we just read, we are also, Jesus kind of floods his disciples with so many different kinds of images as well. There's the sheep, there's the shepherd, there's the gate, there's the sheephold, and then he talks of bandits, and then he talks of thieves, and then there's smooth talking, confident strangers that try to muddy the water and confuse the, the sheep. And I'm wondering if you're tired of hearing some smooth talkers these days. It seems like we hear a lot of talkers and I wonder constantly, who should we listen to? On the one side, there are those who, who on one side are extreme elements who say that we're going to be quarantining for a year and a half. And there are on the, are on the other side, those who throw caution to the wind. They say, open up the economy, let's get back to work and let's meet at the beach. And there are leaders who play the blame game, whether it be China or the World Health Organization. And we say, who do we believe? And Pastor Chris and I want to err on the error um, in the direction of caution. Get good, solid information about testing. We're wondering how many tests are being done here in New Mexico. Contact tracing, you've heard all those things. Following up on new cases, that's the way we're going to solve this. All the, good, all the good data out there says that. We learned from a good friend who's a statistics professor, professor down at Las Cruces, who was in our congregation in Las Cruces, and she said, the really important number to recognize is the R naught, R naught number, or the reproduction number. I'd never heard of this um, before. The number of people that a person with a disease um, can transmit it to, or, the number of cases on the average an infected person will cause during their infectious period. The R naught number, really, really important. And oh Lord, we don't want our church to be responsible for a high R naught number, not at all. And oh, how I would love to hear, hear the voice of the shepherd, the gatekeeper, and I'd like to hear and recognize his voice and follow him. I don't like living on the edge of my seat. Hmm, but do I really have to live on the edge of the seat? Um, then the surface narrative of a type A person, a type A culture is fear, stress, anxiety, tension, worry, distress, alarm, trepidation, and the message the message, at least I seem to hear, is don't trust anybody. And you probably heard an amazing thing in New Mexico during the month of March. There was a record-setting month for firearm sales. There was a record-setting setting for background checks by the FBI. What does that indicate huh. in March? But is there another perspective? Is there another deeper narrative? The author of Psalm 23, King David, or another wise person, um, um, I think is saying, yes, there is another way to live life, to experience life. Um, and I love, I love Dallas Willard's 23rd, Psalm 23rd, paraphrase version of this very, very famous Psalm. It made me kind of turn my head and look at it very, very differently. Hmm. 
And he says quite prov provocatively, provocatively, did you notice in the last version, ver verses of that, surely this world is a perfectly safe place for me to be because I dwell and abide with God in the fullness of his life and in the kingdom of heavens. Wow, that's amazing. Really? Is this life, is this place really perfectly safe because the Lord is my shepherd? More often, says one person, that the words of the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, is more often carved on tombstones than in the reality of our life. And so, you now can you pause for a second or pause for a minute and ask yourself, what would it be like to live with a life, a life without fear? What would it be like? What would it be like to not fear death? Oh, one of my fears, I have to admit, um, is when I was young, I lived through a family bankruptcy um, as a young child. Um, and uh, the big fear was running out of money and not knowing if there was going to be enough money for the next week. Um, and it's amazing. It's amazing how these fears are still with me. And you have to watch out, watch out for those early fears in life, how they can resurface later, later in life. And so what if, what if we did not have, we did not fear life? What if we didn't fear being betrayed or abandoned? or lied about, or having a fatal disease, or our finances going down the tube, or seeing our loved one walk through the doorway of misfortune or difficulty. In this world, is there a deeper narrative um, that's way down deep in the sea, um, beneath the crashing waves um, around us? There's an interesting exercise that I found out about, and this is in a 23rd Psalm participant book. And the authors said, challenged uh, the readers to, to, do, to try out something. They said, paraphrase the first three verses so that it says the opposite. Can you do that with me? So we would say, the Lord is not my shepherd. God does not care for me. I lack all kinds of things. Let me outline all those things that I lack for you right now. No. Second verse, the Lord makes me get up in the middle of the night and worry and leads me on a treacherous path where I fret about slipping and falling a lot of the time. The Lord leads me to the treacherous seas and threatens to throw me overboard without a life jacket. Huh. That's an interesting exercise, isn't it? Hmm. And we have to ask ourselves, is that a vision, sometimes a little bit of the God that we have, the providential God? You know, um, sometimes I think we Lutherans have an understanding or a version of faith where we don't have to rely on God. Um, we don't need to trust in God. We have a version that says, God helps those who help themselves, including myself, period. But sometimes, um, often the circumstances of life are brought before our doorsteps in many, many strange ways. So we have to learn that we, we have to learn that we can trust God's abundant provision. And have I gotten there? Ask my wife, no. Hmm? But I'm growing slowly, gradually, a step forward, a step, a couple steps backward. And it seems that I think that God kind of likes uh, putting Krista and me in situations where we have no choice but to trust him. And so we have to ask, how about you? Hmm. Dallas Willard says, often God allows us to reach the point of desperation 
so that we can learn to trust. It's a hard lesson, but it's an essential one. The Lord is my shepherd. I have a life without lack. I shall not want, says another translation. Others say, I lack nothing. <laughs> and someone said, the life without lack is known by those who have learned to trust God in the moment of their need, not when the storm has passed, but in the moment of their need. And that is right now. This is the moment when everything is gone that you know, then I know, then the reality of God. And that this is that time. So may we, people of St. Luke, and those people who are, you are watching this worship service, come to know the Lord is my shepherd. I have a life without lack. Amen.